So there's absolutely no way I can answer this many questions in 20 minutes. So just uh, for the record, if um, I don't get your question answered, which more than likely I will not get all of them answered, um, <clears throat> if you want, you really want an answer and uh, you think I can help you, then you can email me and I'll uh, endeavor to do so, okay? So I'm really sorry, but there's no way because I will need to start our last session at one o'clock. All right. <clears throat> um, one was very easy. What is your uh, Pandora station that you like to listen to? <laughs> I'll answer that one first. Um, I usually, uh, Sovereign Grace, the Gettys, something like that. That's, that's um, I also like to listen to a cappella hymns. I actually have about five or six, and, uh, but probably the Sovereign Grace and the Gettys are my go-tos because their music is, um, <clears throat> for the most part, you know, some of them I skip or put thumbs down, um, is they're rich in theology, but also very beautiful music. And so those are my kind of go-to. Um, this lady has some questions about discipleship. What do you consider as far as deciding who to disciple? Um, when I'm pursuing somebody myself, I look for someone who is faithful. Uh, as Paul told Timothy, you pass down to faithful, faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So you want someone who's faithful to the means of grace, faithful to God. Um, I have discipled many women who are not, and it doesn't usually last very long <clears throat> because they just aren't faithful. They don't want to do the assignments. They don't want to meet. They, you know, so you want to do someone who is, pursue someone who is faithful. Now, many times someone will come to me and ask me to disciple them, and I never turn anyone down. I think I've only turned down, I don't even know if I've ever turned anyone down, but um, usually um, they're not, that sometimes they are not faithful, and so that doesn't maybe show up till later on, and so they usually end up, you know, <clears throat> falling by the wayside. <clears throat> um, do you ask someone if she wants to be discipled or do you wait for someone to ask you? I've done both. I have pursued women that I see a lot of potential in and I have a passion to help women. And so um, if I see someone, I think there's potential, I just say, hey, how let's, let's get together for coffee and uh, talk. And then during, during that time, I'll ask her if she might be interested. Um, and I've done the other where people have approached me about it. So I've done both. <clears throat> is there a book, excuse me, is there a book you can recommend on how to disciple and a book that would be good to go through with the person you're discipling? I've written a book called The Discipleship. Martha Peace has a book called The Titus II Woman. Uh, Susan Hunt has a book called Spiritual Mothering. Those are the three that I know of <clears throat> that I've read. I wrote one, but that have to do with discipleship. Um, and that would be mainly for you to get started on how to disciple. Um, and I go through different things with women I disciple. First of all, my, my biggest concern when I meet with a woman is her salvation. And then <clears throat> after uh, we've determined that that's legit, sometimes you don't know till later, but I do try to get her into the scriptures. Um, if, she has, if she already does not have a habit of reading God's word, I try to encourage that highly. I try to get her to, into memorization and things like that. So, um, <clears throat> but I use a lot of different materials. Um, right now I'm going through systematic theology with a couple of gals I'm mentoring. I'm go I use Martha Peace's The Excellent Wife. Um, I'm using Trusting God by Jerry Bridges with several women, um, you know, just different things. Just make, I would just make sure if you use any books outside of the Bible that uh, they're solid and might ask your pastor or your elders to make sure that they're quality books before you start taking a woman through them. Um, I had one lady I was working with and she wanted to go through a book and I said, now, I've never read this book. And I said, I'm willing to start it but not guaranteeing we're gonna go through it. And I went through about two chapters and I threw it in the trash. And I said, and you need to throw yours in the trash because that is trash. And uh, <clears throat> so um, don't be afraid to do that if you start something and it doesn't, isn't good. How can you share, this is a different question, can you share how to encourage a Christian who struggles with depression? I have counseled a lot of women who struggle with depression that actually used to be the number one reason I would see women in the counseling room was for depression. Um, I think now it's maybe 
um, anxiety and worry seems to be more so than depression. Um, <clears throat> but usually I will encourage her to memorize scripture, Psalm 42, 43, great passages for depression. Why are you cast down on my soul? Put your trust in God. He is the lifter of your countenance. Um, I also will encourage her. I've gone through Bob Somerville's book, If I'm a Christian, Why Am I Depressed? Very good book. He himself struggled with depression. He's a professor at Master's College. He uh, also is on the ACBC. Um, I don't know if he's a fellow, but he is certified with the uh, National Association of Nuthetic Counselors, which is now called the National so Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. Um, he himself has struggled with deep depression. And so he gives, it's very practical, it gets you into the scripture. He's got assignments at the end of every chapter, and so I'll go through those with women. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Spiritual Depression, great read. Um, so those would be the things I would recommend. And, you know, don't, when you're try trying to help someone with depression, just remember you can't label depression a sin. It is not a sin. Otherwise, Christ is a sinner because he was depressed. He says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. And so depression is not a sin, but choices that women make while they're depressed are sinful. Elijah was depressed. David was depressed. Paul was depressed. Um, you know, I don't struggle with depression. My husband used to struggle with depression early in ministry. He doesn't anymore. Um, and it was hard for me as a woman who I just don't have, I just don't struggle with that. I might have a blue day or an off day or something like that, but I, I just don't struggle with depression. Um, but you want to make sure that you don't condemn that, but you do try to help them get out of the pit, but you also um, teach them to make right choices even if they're depressed. Even if they don't feel like getting out of bed, they need to get out of bed. Even if they don't feel like going to church, they need to go to church. Even if they don't feel like getting, reading the Bible, they need, you know. So um, that gives, depression is not an excuse for sin. So you want to make sure that if you're trying to help someone who's depressed, don't, don't minimize their sin and encourage them to do the right thing regardless of how they feel. Um, I tell that to women often who have struggled with submission to their husbands. I said, you be submissive no matter what, and trust the feelings will follow. I like what Jerry Bridges says in his book, Trusting God. He says, I've learned to trust God in everything and hope my feelings will follow. <laughs> so, you know, women are so feeling oriented. I'm a woman, but uh, sometimes my husband will say, I don't know how you work with women. And um, <laughs> he just shakes his head every time, you know, something comes up and he'll just go, oh my. And, uh, but you want to you speak truth to her. And... Okay, <clears throat> how should I respond to pressures of pressure or feelings of not being as spiritual, as spiritually mature as others in my church? Um, well, you don't, you don't want to be base anything on your feelings, but also 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says those, that, those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. And so... You're running your own race. Paul says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so ladies, you know, some of us are really sprinting and some of us are, you know, barely, <laughs> we're getting there, reach running. In fact, the, the Greek there indicates that we're each individually running our own race. And so don't look at the person behind you and think more of yourself than you should. Don't look at the person ahead of you and think less of yourself. Just look at yourself, run your race with patience. And don't compare yourself among somebody else. The, uh, Paul says that's not wise. And so, you know, sometimes I look at other people and their gifts and their, their walk with Christ and, um, you know, can be very intimidating. But learn to thank God for that. Learn to thank God for the women who are more spiritual than you or the men that are more spiritual than you. And those that are behind you, encourage them to press on. So um, God has got you where you are, and you need to look to him and not look to others. That's, again, where we get all messed up. Um, follow their examples, but don't allow that to feel, make you feel inferior. You run your own race, but run it correctly by laying aside your sins, right? Okay, do you think it's wise to be in fellowship with a person who has left the church that I am a member of? They are bitter and discussing their offenses about my elders with me. No, I do not think that is wise. The reason I do not think it is wise is because the Bible says it's not wise. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, I wrote to you not to keep company with fornicators. 
Yet, all together with the fornication, fornicators of this world, or the covetous extortioners, idolaters, then you have to go out of the world. But I've written to you, do not keep company with a man that is called a brother, who's a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner, do not even eat with such a one. Now, the word for railer means to complain bitterly. So if you are with someone who is formerly in the church that you were at and they want to get to you and complain bitterly about the elders in your church, you're really violating 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You're not to even eat with such a one. What I would do is what my husband and I have done many times in, over the years in ministry is when people are disgruntled with various churches they've been. In fact, the one of the church that we started, we had several members from another church in our town that wanted to come and join this, this church we were starting. And my husband said, not until you go to your elders, um, not until you go to the elders from your former church. And so I would encourage whoever this is who's bitter, who has offenses, they uh, need to take care of the offense and they need to do it quickly. In fact, they shouldn't even go to church until they do. The Bible says, don't come and bring your gift before the altar. If you've got something against your brother, you go and take care of it. Then you come and worship. And so I would hold them accountable to do the right thing. And I would do whatever you can to help them do the right thing. So, um, and I would just tell them, you know, uh, I love you, but you know what? I can't, I guess I will not violate God's word. And as long as you're going to get with me and complain, um, I, I just won't entertain it because you don't want to participate in their sin. And it's, it's, you're not to uh, receive an accusation against an elder unless there's one or two witnesses. And so you don't want to, you don't want to be involved in compounding sin upon sin. Um, can me and my husband decide how many children we want to have, or is that a sin? I was tempted to put this in the back, but, <laughs> um, you know, that, that's such a, hard issue in our culture. Um, for us, we have two children. I had two cesareans. You know, we couldn't huff and puff and blow the baby out. And uh, even though we went to Lamaze and I was in 36 hours of labor and they, my son had already had his first bowel movement in the womb. And so it was an emergency cesarean. I then got pregnant with our second and <clears throat> it was because I was cut a certain way. I had the second child the same way, and my doctor after that said, you would be very foolish to have any more children. It's because of the way that your abdomen had to be cut. It could be a risk to you, it could be a risk to the, to the child. Um, so after that, my husband and I prayed about it for a while, and then we decided that that was all. We weren't gonna risk my life or the life of an unborn child to have a baby. Um, and I don't feel we were in sin. You know, we prayed about it. We talked about it. We listened to what the doctor said. And uh, I had, by that time, I'd had other surgeries as well. And um, so we just decided, you know, my, my stomach looked like a road map, you know. So uh, we just decided that was it. But I, I don't believe there's anything wrong in you and your husband deciding. I do believe you, the way you decide, you have to be biblical about that. I would not take any birth control pills that abort a baby. Um, there are some natural methods of birth control that you can do. Um, and so I would just be very cautious, very wise. I also wouldn't let others judge you for if you decide like we did, we could, you know, two is our limit. But if you want to have, you know, 18 children like Susanna Wesley did, that's up to you too. And so, you know, blessed is the man who has his quiver full. Uh, you know, when we got married, I wanted six kids. I came from a family of seven. And I, I told my husband I wanted six kids, and that's really what I was going to do until the doctor really cautioned against that. So, um, but I don't think it's a sin. I would have a hard time proving that biblically, but I think that's up to you and your husband. I've had some places where I go where women will tell me, you know, there's such pressure in here in this church. Uh, for me to date my husband once a week. And I said, really? Uh, I said, well, have you asked the, the women that say that to you? Where's that in the Bible? I said, I can't even see Sarah and Abraham, Abraham having time to go on a date. And um, so we want to make sure we don't pressure young women into something that's not biblical. So, um, but I do say that's a, uh, you know, that's not really a topic that I like to approach, but I, it was asked, so I'll try to answer it the best I can. And if you disagree, that's okay. But just don't come up and shake me, okay? <laughs> I'm very fragile. I've only had a banana and a few nuts this morning, so. <clears throat> so. 
As a single mom, is it okay for her to give biblical advice to her sons, basically teaching a man? Yes, of course it is. Uh, Ephesians 6 says, parents bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, Paul tells Timothy, from a child you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise into salvation. And he knew the holy scriptures from his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. And uh, Timothy's father was a Greek. And so he uh, was not, you know, Timothy wasn't taught the word by his dad, but by his mother and grandmother. So uh, you're not teaching a man, you're teaching your child. What I am forbidden to do, and you are forbidden to do, is to teach men in public assembly. Uh, it is, I permit not a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man. And so um, <clears throat> I, am, I am prohibited to uh, have men in this congregation right now. And so that would be where the, the, law, the line would be drawn. Now, having said that, I will say I know men that read my books. They listen on the, you know, and, uh, you know, I can't really, you know, I don't know any, any scripture that violates that. But in the public worship, I am forbidden. And I really, I have had actually several times where I've said, I will not start until you remove the men. I've even was in one venue where I made people, I made men, it was men and women together, and I was teaching a group of ladies, and there was about a thousand ladies there, and the men didn't want to leave, and I said, I'm not going to start till you leave, and I made a lot of people mad. So, um, and for me, as a woman, it's very awkward. I mean, I've had men that are, like those guys, they're doing the sound system, and uh, there's allowances for that, but it's, it's very awkward to me, especially because I'm a woman and I'm trying to teach women, and sometimes I get personal about women things, you know? And so, um, old women are teach young women, so that's the model. I don't know why I got into that. It has nothing to do with that question. <laughs> oh, is it appropriate to pray for unbelievers' prayer requests? That, you know, this question really got me. I was like, I was really scanning scripture in my mind, trying to think of that. Is it appropriate to pray for unbelievers' prayer requests? Um, I do have unbelievers. Uh, I have family who are unbelievers. They've asked me to pray about certain things, and I have prayed, uh, you know, for, for them. I don't know anything in Scripture that prohibits that. In fact, I often think it's odd that unbelievers will often come uh, in a time of crisis to a believer, and they will say, you know, my dad's dying, and would you pray? And so I actually would encourage it because you just don't know if through that uh, the Lord, um, you know, in fact, my sister who just moved to Oklahoma, she's not a believer and neither is her husband. And um, my husband told her we were praying for the sale of their house out in California. And uh, she called one day and she said, well, I guess God's answering your prayers. And I've shared the gospel with my sister many times. She's not a believer and she actually is a God mocker. But I thought it was interesting that she said, well, God answered your prayers. So... Um, you know, I, I do, and I have many times prayed for others when they've asked me to. I don't see anything in Scripture that prohibits that. But again, I was trying to scan the Scriptures and couldn't really think of any biblical examples. <clears throat> Except, well, never mind, I won't get into that. John 17, that could be a big, deep theological discussion that we don't have time for because I have three minutes to answer all these questions. Okay, um... If God does not hear the prayers of sinners, then why, as a lost person, should I pray to ask God to save me? Would he hear me? Yes, of course he would. John 9 is the context where it says, now we, now we know that God does not hear sinners. John 9. But Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So God does hear that prayer of a sinner turning from sin to repentance and faith in Christ. So that's a very simple answer. Are you still memorizing a verse a day? How do you do it? Am I in sin if I don't memorize scripture? It's funny. The girl that brought us here yesterday, she said, I've read your book on scripture memorization. <clears throat> she said, if you were, do you still feel the same way or would you write the same book? And I said, no, I'd actually probably be more radical. <laughs> so it's probably a good thing I don't write a, a sequel to it. Um, Yes, I am memorizing a verse a day. I, I, for a long time, was making excuses not to, but I finally, I was in the acts, and I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm not getting this done. So the, the girl that holds me accountable back home, I said, I want you to hold me accountable to memorize a verse a day. So I finished acts, and then I said to somebody I disciple, I said, now I want you to humor me before I die. And I said, I'd like for you to memorize a book of the Bible with me. And I only had Mark, Luke, and um, 1 Corinthians left. 
So she said, okay, let's do Mark. So we got through uh, chapter four and she said, Susan, I've got to stop. She's a golf instructor. She's a golf pro. She teaches eight to 10 lessons a day, has three children that all golf and all in tournaments. And she said, I just can't, I'm dying. And she said, when, when school starts back up, she said, I'll start back. Well, I've already finished chapter five, so she's got a lot of catching up to do. <clears throat> but um, I do memorize a verse a day and, and uh, I do uh, love it. Um, how I do it is um, the method my husband shared with me, and I don't know how much time I have to get into that, but it's basically uh, the same way anybody else does, blood, sweat, and tears. But whatever I memorize, I put on a recording device uh, and with my voice as fast as I can, I listen to it. Um, I copy the page out of my Bible and I carry it with me wherever I go. In fact, it's in my backpack out there. Uh, Mark 5 and 6 are out there and I pull it out and work on it just like you do, a phrase by a time, you know. And as I get a phrase memorized and a verse memorized, I do the next one. I'm always reviewing, like right now, even though I'm in Mark chapter 6, I'm reviewing Mark 1 to 5 every day. And when I finish, um, a long chapter or a book of the Bible, if it's a short book of the Bible, um, I review it every, when I get finished, I review it every day for 30 days. Or with Mark, what I've done is when I finish a chapter, I review it 30 times that day. And uh, then you pretty much have it. But I always review everything um, that I memorize within a two to three week period of time. Um, <clears throat> it is a discipline, it's a wonderful discipline. The reason I told the young girl, or the lady, she, I don't know how young, I don't wanna point her out, but anyway, the reason I told her I'd be more radical about it now is because as I've thought more on Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates, which is memorized day and night. I said, you really can't get away from the fact that that is really what we're supposed to be doing day and night. And we're supposed to be meditating and thinking on God's word and memorizing it. And so I probably be, would be more radical today if I wrote a book about it. Plus I've seen the advantage in my own life and in the lives of people I try to help. And uh, just, I, I mean, we could get into how the way it cha changes your life, changes the way you think. Am I in sin if I'm not memorizing scripture? Um, Boy, anybody got tomatoes on their plate they're going to throw at me? You know, I, I, I wouldn't be, I couldn't be as bold to say you're in sin, but I would say that you have to deal with Psalm 1, that you should be meditating day and night. You have to deal with Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell, dwell in you richly. Um, you have to do to deal with a lot of the Old Testament that we're to keep the law of God in the front of our mind. So um, I can't say you're in sin, but I would say that if you have a mind that, uh, a working mind, you don't have any mental handicap, you should be trying to memorize something of God's word. Whether you do it daily, you know, that's up to you, but um, I would develop that as a discipline. You know, we have a discipline of prayer, discipline Bible reading, discipline going to church, discipline, you know, evangelizing, discipline giving of our offerings, but uh, it seems like the discipline of scripture memorization is a lost art. So I would encourage you highly to do that. Mm -hmm.